Okay, so then we already left off in part one, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and these are two parts of the brain that were discovered through uh, people who had damage to those parts of the brain, and both of these parts of the brain deal with language. I'm sorry, hold on one second. All right, and so this is another way we've learned about the brain over time because damage to these particular people helped us understand that uh, they were really localized parts of the brain that deal with speech production and so something we've learned over time. So you guys saw this. Now let's go ahead and go to aphasia. So aphasia's, aphasia is a type of damage to the brain and specifically we're talking about Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia and these are great examples to help you see how we have learned about the brain through through case studies where there is damage to the brain. So um, Ton had the uh, had the speech impairment where he could only say ton, 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 and he couldn't produce anything other than ton, 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 ton. And so he had what's known as expressive aphasia or Broca's aphasia, and he had um, difficulty producing words. And so I'm going to show you just a, a brief example of a woman who had a stroke and it damaged her Broca's area, and so she uh, now is suffering from Broca's aphasia. And uh, stool is it boy? Is it that uh, landing down? The girl is laughing, and cookie jar Window, curtains, and the out the uh, garden, and trees, um, low grass, and um, lady washing the dishes, and uh, uh, hot and cold water, pla flash, flashing. So you guys can see how she had difficulty producing the words. So there, there was an understanding. She, you could tell she was frustrated. She, she, she knew what she was thinking. The words weren't coming out, and so that's broke his aphasia. And so now I'm going to show you just an example of Wernicke's aphasia, and you'll see there's a really big difference. So you can see the frustration in this lady. She's having really difficult. She's having a difficult time saying those words and producing those words. Uh, Wernicke's aphasia is where uh, they have difficulty having comprehensible speech. And so you'll see with this next woman, her speech is fluent. It's it's normal, like a normal rate of speech, but it's it, it, it makes no sense. Thank you. 
Can you smile? Can you smile at me? Can you smile at me? Can you smile at me? Don't say what I say. I want you to do this. Watch. Look at me. Smile. There you go. That was a very good one, huh? Smile. Smile. There you go. Chew, show me how you chew gum. Chew so slow. Chew the stick. Watch me. this. Good. All right. Cough. 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 How you cough me? Cough. 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 So there we have an example of bronchies aphasia. All right. Okay, so as you could see in those examples, we can learn about how the brain functions through um, damage to the brain. And so those are all case studies of, of people who have had damage to the brain. So we're going to keep moving forward how we understand the brain, how we have understood the brain. So we're going to move on to talking about different ways that we have learned how parts of the brain function. And, and one of those ways is through lesions. And a lesion is just a, a damage or um, just an injury to a part of the brain. And anytime there is a lesion to the brain, we will see an impairment, just like with Ton with the Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia with Phineas Gage, uh, with those lesions, we saw that there was damage to functions. But that also tells us that 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 when that function is impaired, we know that that part is responsible for that function. And so Phineas Gage is a great example of that, of a case study that uh, helped us understand part of the brain through um, damage. This can be done. Uh, also, not just necessarily an accidental lesion, but someone could have a surgical removal. Um, tumors are a great example. If a person has a, a brain tumor that is operable, the, the, the surgeons will try their very best to only get as much of the tumor as they can, and then sometimes they'll even leave parts of the tumor because they don't want to touch that sensitive part of the brain. But if any part of that, that brain is touched, there, there will be an impairment somewhere or somehow. Um, severing neural connections, if there's any kind of um, destruction, any kind of way, electrical, um, any kind of damage that's done can cause a, a lesion in the brain. All right. Uh, ablations are when something is removed, and so similar to lesions, but when something is taken out, we, we would never take out part of the brain unless um, you know, absolutely necessary. Um, but there are studies that are done where parts of the brain are taken out. This would only be done on animals, of course, not done on humans, and it's really still controversial on animals. So human ablation would really only happen with removal of tumors, which I mentioned in lesions, um, but a, an ablation is specifically removal. Lesion is just talking about a damage or an injury. So Continuing to move forward, uh, when we discovered that there were small parts of the nervous system, those really basic fundamental parts of neurons, it really uh, kind of bridged away for new uh, understanding about the brain. And so the man who discovered the neuron or had the idea of the neuron, his name was Santiago Ramon E. Cajol. And uh, he, what, Basically, he had these new ideas uh, that were really not thought of before. He came up with what was known as the neuron theory and then became the neuron doctrine. But before this, people thought that the nerves were made up of just like this reticular tissue and that uh, people didn't really think it had this, this basic unit called the neuron. And so um, he, he theorized this and and it later became doctrine. Now we, we know and believe there are these small little parts called the neuron. Uh, once discovering the neuron, we moved forward and found a way to actually see the neuron. So on the very, very small microscopic level, they can use a technique called the selective silver uh, staining technique where they can actually stain the neuron itself with silver. It has an affinity for silver and so it'll, it'll 
absorb that silver color and then you can uh, pick out each individual neuron and see from neuron to neuron and see the connection and so uh, that has been a great advancement in the discovery since the discovery of the neuron. Another advancement which has been more recent is the understanding that there are now really only 86 and, and this is actually a typo on, on my slide here it should be 86 billion but that there are only 86 billion neurons in the brain, which at one point the estimation was 100 billion, which is actually a pretty large estimation. And so you say, well, where did the 14 or, you know, 14 billion neurons go? And uh, basically it was an overestimation. And, it, and some people might say, oh, that's, well, just an estimation. Well, 14 billion is a lot. It's actually about the size of a baboon brain, 14 billion neurons, so it is a big deal to overestimate that much, but uh, they did this, uh, they, well, took an average of several several men's brains who donated their, their brains to science, and these men were uh, ages 50, 51, 54, and 71, and on average, uh, it came to be about 86 billion with a B neurons. So here is where you can see the um, silver stained neuron. So it, you can you can tell um, it stands out, and you can see the different parts, and you can see the soma there, and you can see the dendrites and the axon. So pretty cool. All right, we can also learn about the brain through electrical stimulation, and um, this allows the ability to test different functions of the brain parts. You can localize seizures. A uh, man named Walter Hess, he experimented on animals with electrical stimulation. He found out um, you could stimulate different parts of the brain and create different behaviors or reactions. And so he stimulated animals, animals brains. He stuck an electrode down into the hypothalamus and caused um, excitement, apathy. He could cause hunger, thirst, urination, defecation. All of these um, bodily functions by just stimulating parts of the brain. Um, so, more advancements. Here's the the rat with the uh, electrical stimulation going down into the brain. There. All right. So now we're going to move into talking about different ways you can track, scan, and image the brain. And so the first one is an EEG. And an EEG is just, it just stands for electroencephalogram. And so an EEG, what it does is it just traces brain activity. It is not, it doesn't take a snapshot. It just uh, records activity. And so it detects the brain waves. And you might have seen um, maybe uh, sleep waves or that up and down movement. Uh, if someone is sleeping up and down and the, uh, the sleep spindles and the delta waves and all of those are, are through an EEG. And so here's the EEG. They have those little uh, metal discs that are on, just are placed around the head that uh, just detect electrical activity. So here's another picture. All right. So the, there are, are two different ones that we'll talk about of imaging, imaging technologies. So one is a CT scan. So this will take a still image it uses x-rays it's a little different than an x-ray in that it it can take cross-sectional images and um, it does it from multiple angles so it's it's just a, it's a little bit um, different than an x-ray but very similar it uses x-rays and that can also be a slight risk of radiation but very small and if you need if you need an image then that that is that is very much more important than the slight risk of radiation um, an MRI is also another way that you can have imaging done um, using the magnetic field. And uh, I'll show you some images here on the next part. The next part, part three, will be much shorter. But I'll, I'll show you some images and then we'll go over um, two more ways to image the brain and scan the brain. And then that'll be it. So um, just check up on, on part three.